going to go ahead and let Donna take the um, show here. Just remember, please use the chat feature at the bottom um, for any tech issues that you're having, because apparently tonight's the night for them, um, or anything that I could as a live the uh, person from the library could help with you. Um, just give give a holler down there and I can try to answer your questions. Um, and then on the bottom also, there's a Q&A part where you can enter in any um, questions that you have about the things that Donna's talking about or any just general garden questions because you know, she's a master gardener, so she can try to help you um, with any questions you might have. We'll answer all of those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, I'll keep an, an eye on the chat in the questions and answers so um, we can keep up and Donna can, can walk us through growing healthy tomatoes. Um, thank you, Donna, so much for doing this. And um, hopefully you guys can learn some some good tips for growing really delicious tomatoes. Thanks. Okay, we're going to talk about growing luscious tomatoes. So um, I don't know, I just looked at mine out there. Uh, we came back from a, a trip uh, yesterday and I've got one cherry tomato that's starting to turn orange, so I'm getting excited. Um, we are halfway through the growing season. And um, I'm gonna kind of divide this into two parts here, what to do now and what to do next year, because we're halfway, like I say, we're halfway through the season and there's some things that you probably can't undo that you may have done so far. So um, we're gonna talk about what you might wanna do next year too, um, that you maybe can't do anymore this year. So the biggest problem with tomato growing in the second half of the summer is disease and pests. In order to understand plant diseases, you have to know the disease triangle. Um, it takes three conditions for a disease to develop. You have to have a host, which is the plant that is susceptible to a particular disease. And each plant has different susceptibilities and they're usually quite specific to the plant or the plant family. Secondly, you need to have the disease pathogen and that's the bacteria, the virus, the um, Fung fungus that causes the disease. And um, then third, you need an environment that's favorable for the disease to grow. Um, and we'll talk about how that works here. Um, on the left-hand side, let's say you have a, a susceptible host, which is your tomato, and you have a pathogen, which is a fungus. But if the environment isn't right for that fungus, it's too dry or it's too hot or it's too cool, um, you won't get uh, the disease on the plant. On the right-hand side, you can see that you can have your susceptible host, which is a tomato. You can have the hot human uh, environment maybe that would cause a certain disease. But if that disease um, spores or uh, bacteria are not present, your plant still won't get the disease. And of course, the third way you can stop the disease triangle is to take out the susceptible host. Um, and in that case, you could have the right environment and the right pathogen, but if the host isn't there to get the disease, um, then you won't have it. In this case, it's kind of hard to remove the host because we want to grow tomatoes. Although there are some tomato plants that are resistant to some of the diseases that we're going to talk about. And if you have trouble with a particular disease, you could look for disease resistant varieties of the tomato um, the next time you grow tomatoes. Um, there's common tomato diseases that we're going to talk about. Um, and the first two, septoria leaf spot and bacterial leaf spot, uh, are often very hard to distinguish between, and both may be present at the same time because they like the same um, conditions. Early blight may be a little bit easier to identify, but often can occur at the same time as the first two also. And even though it's named early blight, it doesn't often show up until later in the summer. Late blight is a very, very uh, serious disease. This is the pathogen that uh, caused the great potato famine um, in Ireland and caused 
thousands of people to die. Um, it winters over in plant material. So those poor farmers, their plants, you know, got blighted and they kept the potatoes from one year to use as seed potatoes for the following year. And the pathogen stayed in those potatoes. Hey, Donna, we're having trouble hearing you all of a sudden. The fruits start to ripen. So we're going to take a look at each one of these a little more closely. Septoria leaf spot favors high humidity and temperatures from about 68 to 77. So kind of moderate to warm temperatures and um, high humidity. Um, it starts out as dark centers, as you can see in the picture here on the oldest leaves and eventually the centers turn tan to white. It comes from spores in the soil that have stayed on tomato debris from a previous year or from a plant that has grown in that area. Um, copper sprays may be preventative before the disease starts, but if you have it on your tomato plants, there is nothing you can do to stop it once it starts. It doesn't infect the fruit, but it will often uh, cause the leaves to yellow and um, die and fall off and the plant is severely weakened or sometimes you only have the plant stem with the tomatoes hanging on it and no leaves. Um, management. For this, um, try to plant where no tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, or eggplants, they're all in the same family, have been for the past three to four years, if possible. Keep tomato leaves dry, as dry as possible, which means overhead with uh, watering is not a good thing. Um, if you have to water overhead, water in the morning so the leaves dry out in the sun during the day cage or stake the plants to keep them up off the ground so there's good air circulation. Um, space the plants out so they aren't too crowded, again, for better air circulation. And if you can, water at the base of the plant, use drip irrigation or a soaker hose is probably the best and the easiest way. Um, mulch all exposed soil with plastic or organic mulch and scout tomato plants once a week. Look at the lower leaves for the leaf spots Remove infected leaves and rotten fruit from the garden. Um, you can pick them off the plant or if they've fallen off the plant already, um, remove them and either put them in the trash or bury deeply at the end of the season. Um, don't throw these tomato plants in your compost pile because a home compost pile does not get hot enough to kill the spores of the plant. Um, the second one, bacterial leaf spot, you can see this looks very similar to the septoria leaf spot. Um, and it starts out as small brown circular spots, often surrounded by a slight yellow halo. Um, the center of the leaf spot often falls out. And so then you have a hole and a brown spot and surrounded by a yellow ring. Um, this, these spots may also occur on the stems and on the fruit calyx, which is those little leaves on the top of the fruit where it's connected to the, the branch. And the spots on the fruits are about one fourth inch, slightly raised brown and scabby. Uh, the tomato fruit often have a kind of a waxy halo surrounding the spot on the fruit. The spots can occur on green and red fruit, but do not result in rot. Um, so it, you could use this tomato if you cut out those spots. Um, generally, the fruit does not rot on the plant. Um, early blight, um, and as I said, it's not necessarily early in the season. It comes on a little bit later. Again, um, mostly caused by two related fungi. Um, and they can also both um, can affect potatoes too and eggplants. 
Um, and also weeds in this family like black nightshade, hairy nightshade. Um, and so if you have those kinds of weeds near your garden, your tomato plants could be infected from the weeds. Um, this pathogen also survives on tomato seed and may be introduced on the tomato transplants. So your plants may have gotten this um, before you even transplanted them into the garden. The lower leaves become infected when they come in contact with soil has the, the spores in it, um, or it can be splashed up from the soil by rain. Um, what happens is you get um, a, a brown spot, and if you look very carefully, there are like concentric rings within that brown spot, and that's one of the clues to um, early blight. Um, the fruits kind of develop a sunken, dark, leathery spot. And again, with those concentric rings, as you can see in the bottom picture, um, the fruit probably is not going to be good to eat. Um, very often, the whole fruit is spoiled. There are some disease-resistant varieties. And if you're looking in a seed catalog, the coat is EB for early blight. Um, do not save the seeds from plants that have this from one year to the next because you can infect the following year's plants. Again, management is rotation of the tomatoes, controlling uh, susceptible weeds like nightshades, um, pull out volunteer tomato plants that may sprout in your garden. Um, do not over fertilize though, especially with potassium and avoid working in the plants when they're wet from rain, irrigation, or dew. Again, use drip irrigation instead of overhead irrigation. Stake plants, apply mulch, all the same things we talked about earlier. Remove and bury infective plants, to remove or bury infective plants to reduce the likelihood of a pathogen thriving for the following year. Um, Fungicides, again, if you spray with them uh, fung uh, some kind of a fungicide before the disease develops, that's better than if you wait until you see some of the symptoms. Um, late blight is the really, really serious one. Um, and if you suspect that you have any diseases in your tomatoes, you can actually send um, a picture and or a specimen down to the plant disease diagnostic lab in Madison and they will analyze the disease for free because they are always on the lookout for this late blight disease and they don't want to have some people say well I don't know if I have it or not I'll just wait and see and then it spreads to nearby farms and fields and things and we have like a late blight outbreak. It starts with a dark water soaked looking spot. And it has, as you can see in the picture, a, a light green edge around the dark spot, kind of a halo. Um, this one can kill a plant in like a week. The plant is completely, completely done. Um, the fruits you can see on the bottom are also effective. Um, and it can overwinter in crop debris. Again, do not compost any part of this plant. Uh, put it in a plastic bag um, and put it in the garbage um, and report any suspected plants and send a sample to the plant diagnostic, plant disease diagnostic clinic for free analysis. Um, and they will, you know, instead of charging you for an analysis, they will um, test tomatoes free because you just don't want this disease to show up at all in Wisconsin. Um, let's see, uh, a combination of daytime temperatures in the upper 70s with high humidity is ideal for infection. Um, and never expect, uh, uh, never accept tomato seedlings that show any suspicious leaf spots of any kind. Someone you know wants to give you them or if you're buying tomato seedlings, um, they should look perfectly healthy. You don't want them to show any kind of disease because a lot of these diseases can carry over from year to year. Um, the last uh, one of these um, diseases we're gonna talk about is anthracnose. 
in tomatoes, it usually doesn't affect the leaves, but when the fruits start to get ripe, you have a sunken spot with, a, with little dark centers in it, and that's the spores coming out of the fungus. Um, to prevent um, these from developing, handle your tomatoes gently when you're picking them. And um, if you're, you know, you pick them and maybe they're not quite ripe and you're putting them in a box or on a table or something, handle them gently. Um, use ripe tomatoes in five days or less because a lot of times this fungus will be on the outside of the tomato. And if the tomato gets bruised in any way, um, that's when it starts to enter the tomato and, and causes the disease. If the spots are small and can be cut away, the tomato is still usable. I don't know that you'd want to use the one in the picture that has quite a few spots, but if you only have like, for example, one or two little spots, you can cut those and, and use it. Um, um, if you don't get rid of the tomato once it starts, um, they develop um, more spots and more spots and um, you know, it just gets from, from bad to worse. This fungus can also exude masses of, of um, sl uh, slimy, tan, salmon-colored spores. Um, on ripe fruit, this uh, can develop in five or six days if it's on the outside of the fruit. Um, how did the skin get damaged? It could be from a hailstorm. It could be from blowing sand. Um, or dust. It could happen when by picking tomatoes and piling them in a bag or a basket. Um, in, in other words, any kind of rough handling that breaks the skin or bruises it. Um, don't keep seeds from these plants um, and immediately re remove any infected fruit to prevent it from spreading to other uh, tomatoes. Um, next season, rotate, mulch, avoid overhead watering, again, all those same kind of things, and destroy the tomato plants at the end of the season. Um, this one is called buckeye rot, and it's probably more common down in the south where it's humid and hot. Um, I haven't seen this one in Wisconsin very much, but yeah, on, the, on the rare chance that it might show up in your garden, I thought I would throw it in. Um, it has a large round or oblong lesion. And you can see in the picture, it's got kind of concentric things to it. Um, it turns kind of brown and they're firm with smooth margins, but eventually they become soft and decayed. Um, it's mostly found on fruits that touch the ground or are very near the ground. Um, it doesn't affect the leaves of the plant. And again, high temperatures with high humidity favor this disease. The bottom picture is like the spores that are developing on this tomato. And at this stage, you might see it um, in your garden. You might see this kind of whitish looking stuff on a rotten tomato um, that's been laying on the ground. So um, again, same kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, this is um, especially prevalent when the tomatoes are laying on the ground. They're not staked or mulched or, ca or caged, um, and they're just kind of sprawling on the ground. So some of the things, avoid low areas in fields, um, rotate, stake or mulch the plants. Um, and, you know, I'm repeating myself, but you get the idea. Um, keep the tomatoes where the air can circulate well and um, try to keep the leaves dry. Um, the wilts, Fusarium wilt, um, you'll find that all of a sudden the entire plant turns yellow and wilts. Um, and then eventually the leaves turn brown from yellow and it progresses upward from the base part of the stem. Um, sometimes only one side of a leaf, uh, a branch or one side of a plant will be affected. Um, acidic soil and warm temperatures, warm soil temperatures favor this disease. Um, and uh, this one is what we call a vascular wilt. Um, the pathogen enters the, the tubes that connect, uh, conduct the water up from the, and the nutrients up from the roots to the stem, to the leaves and the stems. And when it clogs up those pipes, so to speak, 
um, the plant can't get the nutrients and water that it needs and then therefore it wilts and dies. So um, affected plants usually die early. They produce few if any fruit. If you split open the stem, you will see a brownish streak running down the stem. That's where this water conducting tube has been clogged up. Um, plants are susceptible at all stages of development, but it's most obvious after um, the plants start flowering and producing fruit because you're putting more stress on the plant. It needs more water and it's not able to get it so that um, it, it eventually wilts and dies. Fusarium is kind of serious in that it can persist in the soil for up to 10 years. So it can be moved around on infective tools, plants, shoes. Um, it can also survive on pigweed, mallow, and crabgrass. So um, if you have this kind of thing going on with your plant, um, it's a good idea to get it um, uh, looked at by the di disease diagnostic clinic because if you have this, it's really important that you don't, uh, that you know that and you don't plant tomatoes there again for probably four or five years at the earliest. Um, it usually doesn't spread to other nearby plants like some of the other diseases we talked about earlier that can spread from one plant to another. Resistant varieties are readily available and it's, it's usually a capital F followed by a one, two, or three that indicate which variety of fusarium um, it, it is, um, which variety of the fungus it's resistant to. So you'll see like an F1, F2, F3, which means that the plant is resistant to all three kinds of fusarium fungus. Um, Verticillium wilt um, <clears throat> also starts on the lower leaves. The leaves turn yellow and drop off just like the other one, but usually both sides of a plant are affected. And this, the plant may survive the season, but it's gonna do pretty poorly. And you can see here, these are the pictures are if you cut through the stem, um, if you cut along the stem, you'll see that brown stripe just underneath the, the surface of the stem and that's where the water conducting tubes are. If you cut it crosswise, like the bottom picture, you will see that the tubes, water conducting tubes there are brown and, and that's what's clogged up and not, keep, not allowing the plant to get the water that it needs. Um, stress plants are more susceptible and this one usually causes daytime wilting then um, they'll say, oh, the plants just need water. So you water them and the next day they look good in the morning. And then by the middle of the day, they start wilting again and they look wilted. And whether you water them or not, the next day they look pretty good. Um, but eventually um, they look less and less and less good. So it might take um, quite a few weeks for this to actually kill your plant. Um, let's see. Um, this discoloration is more pronounced near the soil line, so near the base of the stem, and usually doesn't go up more than 10 or 12 inches. Um, and again, this one has resistant varieties, and these would be the capital letter V. So if you see that, like after the name of a tomato plant or in the plant description, um, that means it is resistant to verticillium wilt. Um, Rotate all, all other tomato family crops, including peppers, potatoes, and eggplant away from this area for at least four years. Corn and beans would be suitable crops to rotate with these. So you could plant those in that spot, just not plants from the tomato family. Um, control measures, we're just gonna kind of summarize what we talked about in all of these so far. Um, these are cultural practices that you can do that will help uh, keep the, the amount of fungal diseases down in your garden. Um, you're trying to prevent them. If you can't prevent them, at least keep them to a minimum. When you're cleaning out your garden, remove plant debris. Also remove diseased leaves and damaged fruit during the season. It's important to keep good garden cleanup because um, those fungal spores can fall off the leaves and the fruit into the soil 
um, pieces of the plant debris, you know, you miss them when you're cleaning up the garden and they stay in the soil for the following year. So it's really, really a good idea to completely um, clean up any of the tomato plants or any plants that show any of the diseases. Very deeply, that means like four feet deep. Most of us don't have that luxury unless you're out in the country and you have lots of space or discard, which means <clears throat> don't send to the compost um, pile in your yard. It means put it in a garbage bag and put it out for the trash. <clears throat> if you happen to have a huge compost pile that gets really hot, like we're talking about 140 degrees at least, um, you could compost, but most people, unless you have a really large compost pile, um, the temperature doesn't get that high. Um, I have a compost pile and if I really get it heating up, I'm lucky to get it up to 110. So um, for most of us, it's not a, a viable option for home composting. It's really important to do crop rotation for all of these diseases. If you have the space, plant your tomatoes in one space and then don't plant tomatoes again in that space for at least three years. So like the fourth year, you might come back and put tomatoes in that space again. If you have that luxury, some people don't. Some people, it's just a matter of moving them from one end of the garden to the other and back again. Um, and if you have really, really severe problems, you might try growing, growing tomatoes in containers for a year or two, just to give the soil a rest and try and reduce the amount of um, spores and stuff that are in the soil. For all of those, all of tomatoes and potatoes and peppers, space at the recommended size. Don't crowd them too close together. When you crowd them, um, there's not good air circulation. The leaves stay wet longer from dew um, and wet after a rain, for example, and, and high humidity. The, the humidity doesn't um, leave the area of the plant. So um, space them out so there's good air circulation and it gives the plants a chance to dry. Use supports to keep the plants off the ground. Whether you stake them on a single stake, you put tomatoes in a cage, um, you put, uh, tie them up to a fence, um, but any, if you, there's any way you can do is keep plants off the ground. Mulch underneath the plants to keep um, the soil from splashing on the plants. And you can use organic mulches like straw or um, maybe the, uh, when you mow your lawn, if you collect the grass clippings, allow them to dry or else just spread them in a, a thin layer um, so they don't uh, mat down and get kind of rotten. Um, but several thin layers and gradually build them up. Um, you can also use non-organic mulches like um, plastics and that sort of thing but you have to remember that they don't allow water to go through. So then you're going to have to use some kind of irrigation underneath the plastic to, um, to um, water the plants. Um, be very careful about weed control because we talked about there are several varieties of weeds that spread these um, fungus spores. So um, the weeds may have it and give it to your tomatoes or your tomatoes can give it to the weeds and then next year the weeds give it back to your tomatoes. Um, so, you know, keeping the, the, the weeds from those susceptible um, plant families uh, out of your garden or from not being near your garden. Uh, water at the ground level, drip hose, uh, drip irrigation, soaker hoses, or if you're watering with a bucket, put the, the watering head down near the ground when you're watering, so you're not watering the whole plant. And then you can also use preventative fungicides if you want. Um, organically, it would be a copper or sulfur spray. Um, there's other, several other chemical um, fungicides too. You would have to ask at a, a farm center or a garden center you know, for um, an appropriate fungicide. Um, conventional fungicides, um, chlorophenol uh, um, is one of them. Um, captan is another one. Organic um, fertilizers or organic fungicides are sulfur or fixed copper or um, one called Serenade. 
So again, you'd have to do a little researching if you want to actually use some kind of spray on your tomatoes. Um, now we're gonna talk about a pest um, that's not a disease. And um, this is uh, a tomato hornworm. And you can see the moth that it produces down in the lower left. Um, it's a pest that you find that's hard to miss. Um, a big hornworm can eat quite a few tomato leaves um, in a day or a couple days. It's called a hornworm because of that spike on the back end of the worm. Um, it's got uh, rows of white with black dots. Um, the best control for this is to just pick them off and um, drop them in some soapy water or squish them. Um, and if you find one though, like as a picture on the right, and it looks like it got little grains of rice attached to it. Um, this has been parasitized by a wasp. Um, it's a brach braconid wasp. And what it does is it lays its eggs on the tomato hornworm. The eggs hatch, the larva, go inside the worm and feed on the insides of the worm. And then they make those little cocoon things on the outside. And then they hatch from there into the adult wasp. So if you see one like this, let it be in your garden because every one of those little um, cocoons is going to become another wasp that will go and infect some more tomato hornworms somewhere. So avoid um, squishing or getting rid of this one if it's got the, the cocoons on it. Um, I have been growing tomatoes probably for 40 years, more than 40 years, and I've never seen this guy, um, but they're around. So um, if all of a sudden something's been eating your tomatoes and you're pretty sure it's not deer or something, um, it might be this guy. Um, there's a few other things that might bother um, tomatoes. Cutworms are a larva form um, of a moth again. And what they do is they burrow down, they're coiled up like this just under the soil surface. And then at night they come out and they um, cut off the plant right about at the soil line. Um, this happens more often when the plants are small, um, but it, it can also be a bigger size and also have this happen. So if you think, if you see one like this, um, dig around in the soil right around the base of the plant and you'll very often find this thing sleeping during the day. Um, the other thing that can bother tomato plants and it's usually not a problem for the plant, it's just kind of cosmetic because it's got the holes in the leaves, is flea beetles. And this is a really, really tiny little beetle. Um, and what it does is it chews on the leaves and um, causes the little holes. So uh, in either case, um, the, the flea beetles is, is something that's, you know, if you want to use row covers or something, um, but you also have to take off the row covers because tomatoes need a pollinator to make fruit. Um, some insecticides you can use, aceta, tamiprid, permethrin, malathion, carbol, um, spinosad, um, some spinosad and pyrethrins are acceptable for organic farming, um, but you have to remember that anytime you apply a pesticide, you're also running the chance that you are also going to kill the good bugs that are also present in your garden, like pollinators and that sort of thing. And so you um, be sure that you, if you're going to use one, be sure that it's okay to use it on tomatoes and that it is actually targeted for the pests that you have. So, um, well, there's another one too, kale and clay. The brand name is Surround. That's an organic substance that can be used as a repellent too. And you just spray that on and it kind of forms a coating on the plant, um, the leaves that protect it from the pests. Um, pesticide and herbicide problems. Um, we just talked about it a little bit. Um, the, the bad thing about using a pesticide in your garden, unless you really, really have to, and you know exactly what it is that you're trying to control, um, is that it kills beneficial insects too. 
Um, and we all know the status of pollinators now that there's a, a big um, shortage of pollinators. Um, it kills off the larva of the butterflies and those kinds of things. Um, so if you're going to use something, be absolutely positively sure of the pest or disease. Um, call your local extension office, um, do some research on the web um, to make sure that you have identified the pest or the disease. And then use a pesticide or herbicide that's formulated for that pest or disease. Always start with the least toxic alternative. Um, and sometimes that is really no herbicide at all. Sometimes a strong um, spray of water from your garden hose will knock off a lot of um, pests like aphids and that sort of thing um, and mites. And so um, you don't always have to use an herbicide in order to control it. We talked about all of the cultural practices so far like spacing, watering, mulching, weed control, fertilizing to keep your plants really healthy and crop rotation. And if you do use a pesticide or herbicide, read and follow the label directions. It's really, really important. Read them before you begin. Just don't assume that you know how to use it because there's a rate at which it has to be used, um, sometimes a time of day that it has to be used um, in order to avoid killing the, the good guys. Um, many times people are encouraged to spray like around sunset um, because the pollinators are least active during that time. So just be sure, be very, very careful about the herbicides and pesticides. Now we're gonna talk about some things that have nothing to do with pests and they might cause problems for tomatoes also. So um, some of these are blossom end rot, sun scald, fruit packing, cat facing, leaf roll, blotchy ripening, lack of fruit set and herbicide damage. So we'll take a look at each one of these. Blossom end rot, is caused by a low um, level of calcium in the fruit. And it often starts very early and you won't see it a lot of times on the plants um, until you, they start to ripen and you go to pick them and then you turn them over and the bottom side has this brown spot on it. Um, it's caused by too much or too little water. So for example, irregular watering, um, like the plants get really dry, then you water them some, or they're getting a little dry and you have a, a huge rainfall and the soil is really soaked. So the plants sucking up a whole bunch of water all of a sudden. Um, so in that case, the calcium intake can't keep up with the plant growth. And then you get this um, blossom end rot. The top picture shows what it looks like in the early stages um, on a green fruit. And then the bottom picture shows what it looks like later on. Um, if you have high soil salts um, in your soil, that can also cause this, also injury to roots, so the plant can't take up enough calcium in the roots. Too much nitrogen too early in the season. We always say don't um, fertilize your tomatoes until they start to set tomatoes. Um, the fruit is edible after cutting off the dark area unless it's decayed inside the fruit. Um, adding calcium to the soil though is not going to be, not going to solve the problem. Um, I mean, you hear people say, well, I put eggshells in with my tomato plants. Um, I put Epsom salts in with my tomato plants or whatever. And it's usually not a problem of um, the actual amount of calcium that's in the soil. It's an imbalance with the water, the nitrogen and the pH of the soil and all those kinds of things. Um, it's kind of a combination of things. It usually affects the first fruits of a plant and um, the later fruits usually don't have this. So um, it's better to keep your plants well watered um, in the beginning especially um, and avoid too much nitrogen early on. So um, sun scald. Um, this is caused by exposure to strong sunlight. And it, what it looks like is kind of a bleached area on the tomato. It can be kind of grayish or uh, yellowish grayish. Um, it's caused by the tomatoes getting too much sun. And it, this happens when either you over prune the plants or the plants lose their, 
uh, leaves because of some kind of disease. And so the tomatoes are growing in too much sun. So to avoid this, you need to keep the plants healthy so the diseases don't start and so that your plant has plenty of leaves. Use a shade cloth if necessary. It's um, a fabric that um, you can get it in certain degrees, like you can get it in 10% shade all the way up to like 80 or 90% shade. And um, you kind of sometimes see shade cloth used in areas where they want to provide some shade maybe for people sitting, but not total shade like a, a, a canvas or something. So, um, but you can, you can buy this in plant supply stores, garden supply stores. Um, you can eat it um, unless black mold or other decay develops like you see in the bottom picture there. Um, but if it's just like the top picture, you can cut out that spot and you can still use the rest of the plant. Um, let's see if there's anything here. Um, I think that's it. Oh, it, it, more, it more often occurs, um, or you more, most see it um, when the tomatoes are mature green. So in other words, they're turning a lighter color of green. And this is called a breaker stage where they're just going from that light green to starting to look kind of orange. That's when this will um, most often show up in the fruit. Um, Cat facing. You've probably seen this if you've grown tomatoes before, and it has nothing to do with cats. Um, it's deformed fruits, and it usually has large scars, or sometimes it has holes in it, like you can see in the tomato on the right, um, usually on the bottom of the fruit. And it's caused by cold or cool temperatures about three weeks before the tomato plants bloom. Um, heavy pruning um, may also be a cause. The fruits are edible after you trim away the, the black parts, um, but it's, um, again, more of a cosmetic thing. It's not caused by any disease or anything like that. Fruit cracking. Um, this can be related to the variety. Some tomatoes have thicker skins and more resistant to cracking, and some have thinner skins. Um, largely, it's called by, caused by moisture fluctuations, usually a dry period followed by a lot of rain or by heavy watering. So in order to prevent this, do consistent watering and mulch to can save moisture. Um, maintain good leaf cover on the plants. Um, can also be caused by air temperature fluctuations, which causes the plant to grow faster or slower. Um, the fruits, again, can be used if you can cut around the, the um, parts that are cracked there, unless they have uh, mold growing in them, then do not eat them if the, the mold is present. Leaf roll. Um, sometimes leaves roll because of virus infections, herbicide damage, and environmental stresses, but um, common leaf roll is uh, caused by a stress, usually cold temperatures and wet soil. It's more common in the first part of the tomato season than it is later on. The leaves kind of fold and roll inward with the bottom side rolling up and in um, towards the center of the plant. Um, it's caused by the stress on the plant and it's kind of trying to keep in the heat and the moisture. Uh, one thing to do is make sure that you harden off your plants really good um, avoid over fertilizing until the plants start setting fruits and maintain even soil moisture and avoid root damage. Those are some things you can do to prevent the leaf roll. If it happens later in the season and the plant leaves are also turning yellow or they have spots on them or something, then it's more likely to be caused by a disease. Um, some varieties are more susceptible to this than others also. Um, and it is, um, again, more of a, a growing condition thing than anything else. Um, let's see, zippering. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a funny one because um, you can see in the, the top photo, it looks like kind of a crack or a start of a crack, but then going across that line are also little cross hatch marks. Um, and 
also find along one of those cracks a hole, like the picture on the bottom. This is caused by the anther. It's the part of the plant that, that holds the pollen or part of the flower that holds the pollen gets attached to the ovary wall of the new fruit. And that's what causes this. It's more common in colder weather. The fruit is entirely edible. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. It's just kind of a weird thing that happens. Um, so, and this one again is um, something that you really can't do anything about because it actually happens inside the, the flower of the plant. Poor fruit set. Okay, this one, um, you looks like you've got these really beautiful plants. They look really healthy. They're dark green. You've got lots of leaves, but you don't have any fruit on them. And you're wondering, okay, now what's happening here? Because the plants look like they're healthy. Um, so some of the causes of poor fruit set, cold spring nights, or if the temperature in the summer dips, dips below 55 degrees, the tomato flower will not be pollinated and therefore you won't get a uh, tomato fruit. Opposite one, if the daytime temperatures are really, really high, like it gets above 90, um, and the nights stay above 70, um, you also won't get the flowers to pollinate and set fruit. So especially the high temperatures, if there's hot, dry winds and not enough water. Another reason your tomatoes might not be getting tomato fruits um, is they don't have enough light. So if they're growing in part shade, uh, they, they might not be getting fruits or might not be getting very many. Too much nitrogen in the fertilizer produces lots and lots of heavy, uh, healthy looking leaves, but it also delays the, the time before the flowers appear and the pollination, the, the fruit set. And believe it or not, smog or ozone also causes the flowers not to produce fruits. So um, there's a number of different things. That's why be careful. Um, we can't do anything about the excessively cold or excessively hot temperatures. You can do something about the light intensity um, by moving your tomatoes next year, maybe to a place with more sun. Um, and also by not fertilizing too much too early in the season. Wait until later to add that fertilizer when the plants start growing the fruits. Um, a common one, if someone has sprayed near your garden, doesn't even have to be real near your garden, like your next door neighbor, it can be actually, you know, like a couple of doors away even, um, is herbicide injury. Somebody sprayed their lawn and um, it was a hot or a windy day and the drift from the spray followed the wind and ended up landing on your plants. Um, tomato plants are, are highly susceptible to herbicides um, and they, it causes a twisting, curling, um, sometimes discoloration, sometimes it'll kill the whole plant. Um, and the, the picture on the top is like a broadleaf herbicide type of damage. So this is like something you would use to spray the weeds in your lawn. The one on the bottom, that blotchy white looking stuff, that's glyphosate, which is a, a total plant killer, um, like Roundup, that causes that kind of damage on a tomato plant if it doesn't kill the plant. Um, and so um, it could be caused by drift. It also could be caused by contaminated soil or mulch. Um, this is why if you're going to use uh, lawn clippings, if you've treated your lawn, do not use the lawn clippings for mulch in your garden um, for at least four moorings or more. Um, probably better not to use it at all. Um, and if you're going to treat your lawn, just leave the clippings on the lawn. It's better for the lawn anyway. So, and again, we're talking here about being um, careful with pesticides and herbicides, um, especially uh, trying to apply those when it's windy or really hot because in really hot weather, the, it's, the uh, herbicide vaporizes and then it actually can float on the wind and travel quite a ways. So um, not only is it important not to use 
things on your own garden, it's important to be aware of where uh, this might be coming from other places. So some of the more uh, friendly ways, um, things that you can use that can control insects and pests are horticultural oil, neem oil, spinosad, um, Bt, which is, is called Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, it's various soil bacteria that are um, specific to certain plants. Like if you have the little green worms on your uh, cabbage or your broccoli or your Brussels sprouts, um, there's a Bt that will kill those. There's a Bt that will kill beetle larva, um, like Japanese beetle larva, um, botanical oils, um, sometimes just using all the cultural methods we talked about. Um, another thing is using, like I said, a strong spray of water from your hose to knock off um, insects off of plants. Um, so these are things that can be used which with greater safety than using herbicides. Okay, then we're gonna talk a little bit about how to um, harvest your crop so that you get the best harvest and get those tomatoes taken care of before they go bad. Um, about a month before frost, you can remove the blossoms and very small fruit from the tomato plant. And this will force the plant to put more of its energy into ripening the fruits that are already on the plant and that are probably halfway grown size. Um, tomatoes can be harvested when they're nearly fully red and ripened indoors to prevent cracking, splitting, and some of the disease issues like anthracnose that might happen out in, excuse me, out in your garden. Um, do not refrigerate unripe tomatoes. Um, they won't ripen in your refrigerator. Uh, and so don't keep them at like room temperature if you want them to ripen. Spread them out in boxes or trays. Light is not necessary for them to ripen. Um, do not allow them to touch or else wrap them individually. And this is so that you don't pass um, disease from one to another. If you've got one that's got uh, some kind of bacteria on it or whatever, you don't want that to spread to all the tomatoes around it. If frost or freeze is predicted, um, you can harvest unripe tomatoes Let's say um, they say it's going to freeze and there's a good chance it's going to freeze again in two days and three days, you know, so you kind of know that your growing season is at an end. You can pick the tomatoes that are what we call mature green. In other words, they're lighter green color and they're about full size and they will ripen inside. You can store them at temperatures from 55 to 70 degrees, depending on how fast you want them to ripen. Um, some people, for example, might put some of them in the basement um, where it's cooler and some of them leave some of them upstairs where it's warmer. And then as the tomatoes ripen upstairs, you bring more upstairs to the warmer temperatures and they will ripen um, faster. Um, putting um, an apple in a bag with tomatoes will also help them to ripen faster. Um, if you're picking green fruit, make sure that it's at least three-fourths of its normal size and glossy green. Um, pick only blemish-free fruits, no soft spots, disease, sun skulls, or holes from tomato worms or anything like that should be included with the others for ripening. You might want to sort those green tomatoes into three different stages of maturity. Those that are showing red some that are light green and some that are kind of a medium green, but almost full size. Um, if you want to really be sure that um, they're gonna last long enough to get ripe, you can remove the stem and dip each tomato in a solution of one teaspoon of bleach to one quart water. That's one teaspoon of bleach to one quart water, dry off the tomato, and this will help reduce the amount of bacteria and other things that would cause them to spoil before they can ripen. And then pack them into trays with or boxes with similar colors so that you're, um, you know, they'll all be ripening kind of at the same time. If you're packing two layers deep, place black and white newspaper between the layers. Um, some people 
wrap them individually to keep them from drying out and shriveling. Um, they will release ethylene gas as they ripen and that stimulates the ripening. Um, and then about every week or so you need to separate them, kind of filter through them, separate the red ones and the green ones, dispose of anything that's rotting. Um, and if you wanna speed up the ripening, put a ripe tomato in a box of partially ripe or green tomatoes and that will help them green up, uh, ripen faster. Mature green tomatoes will reach eating stage in about 14 days when they're stored at 65 to 70 degrees. Um, if they're stored cooler, like 55 to 60 degrees, they'll ripen in three to four weeks. Um, and in about four weeks or a little more when they're stored at 55. Um, unripe tomatoes, if they're stored below 50, they won't ripen at all. Um, and when they're almost look like they're getting ripe, then bring them up to room temperature for a few days before you use them. Um, and I said before, put them in a brown paper bag um, with or without an apple. The bag helps to keep that ethylene gas right around the tomato and that speeds up the ripening process. Okay, um, now your tomatoes are all harvested and probably it's you've gotten some frost. And so um, you wanna go out and get rid of the diseased plants as soon as possible. Um, wait a minute, my pages here are out of order. Um, and you wanna get rid of that even sooner if you start to see signs of disease on your plants. Keep the weeds under control. So not only clean out your vegetable debris, but also um, take out the weeds near your garden. Remove plants that no longer have any fruits, even if it's, they haven't frozen because the plant is of no value anymore to you as far as producing fruit. And um, it's only there to maybe collect some other kinds of diseases and spread them to other plants. Discard all the tomato plants and the mulch that was underneath them. Sanitize your um, cages and supports, especially if you had any type of disease during the growing season. Um, a 10% bleach solution, um, uh, rinsing the cages and supports with that or spraying with a spray disinfectant um, and you have to spray the entire cage. It has to remain wet for whatever the, the disinfectant says, if it's 10 minutes or whatever. Um, but you can also use like, a, like Lysol or something similar to that to sanitize the cages. And then clean and sanitize any pots that you are going to um, reuse in that 10% bleach solution. So let's say you raise tomatoes this year and you're cleaning up and you're putting away the pots for next year. Be sure that you um, uh, clean them with soil first and sanitize them. So thinking about next year. So if you have developed some potato pro tomato problem and have accurately identified them so you know what you're dealing with, then consider looking for resistant varieties next year. Those little F1 or V1, you know, or it might say um, EB for early blight. Um, there's only a couple of varieties that are resistant to septoria leaf spot. I tried one of them and it didn't seem to make any difference in my garden. Um, and then if you, uh, raise your own plants if you only need to raise a couple tomato plants. Um, try starting them from seed if possible because you have the biggest selection of resistant varieties from seed catalogs um, rather than going to garden centers and that sort of thing in the spring. You may or may not get a resistant variety there. Make a map of your garden this year. Um, so that next year you remember where you planted things this year and you can plan your crop rotation. Um, if you planted too close together this year, uh, make a plan next year how you can increase the spacing between plants. Um, maybe you need to have less of some other crop in order to provide enough space for your tomatoes or you maybe need to plant less tomatoes so you can space them out better. Depends on how well you like tomatoes. Um, if your support system failed you this year, um, you had whip, wimpy cages and the fence you used just kind of curled over under the weight of the tomatoes, 
um, plan to purchase something that will be better next year so that you don't have to worry about those tomatoes getting too close to the ground. Consider drip irrigation or soaker hoses for better, easier watering. And get a soil test. Um, you can do that in the fall um, or you can do it next spring. But if you um, do it in the fall, um, you can amend your soil in the spring as you're getting it ready to plant. Uh, the wait time for a turnaround for a fall soil test is not as great as in the spring because, of course, everybody waits to test them until the spring. So then amend or fertilize, or, uh, fertilize according to those results. If you have to, for example, raise or lower the pH to make it less or more susceptible to um, diseases, you might have to do that. Um, and then... Um, just always, uh, always include something about researching plant problems. Anybody can do this. This is what we do as master gardeners when we have questions about something or people ask us questions. Um, enter your problem briefly into the search box in your, on your computer and add the word extension after the search phrase. For example, when I was doing getting ready for this talk, <clears throat> some of the things I searched for were tomato diseases extension. <clears throat> and then when your results come up, you look for results from, a, from Wisconsin or a state near Wisconsin or one with similar growing zone and climate. For example, it might be University of Minnesota, Iowa, Penn State, Cornell. Um, and you wouldn't want to probably use something from Texas or Alabama because their growing conditions are much different than what we are used to in Wisconsin. And these university extension sites have accurate researched information that you can count on. It's not some person writing a garden blog and said, I planted my tomatoes with such and such and such, and I had beautiful tomatoes this year. Well, it could be because of what they planted it with, and it could also just because, be because it was a great year weather-wise for tomatoes. So, or they had disease resistant plants and they didn't happen to have that disease around in their garden. So um, the researched articles from extension offices and universities are the things that you should look for when you're looking for answers to problems. If you can't um, find answers there or you're still confused or you're not sure, contact your local master gardeners, your county extension office, um, those people will um, tell you where to go or try to find information for you. Um, you can send samples to the plant disease diagnostic clinic. If you have insects that you're not sure of, there's an insect lab down in Madison also. Um, on their website, they have great uh, resources, pictures and things of insects. Um, and again, insects are kind of particular to the plants that they um, eat or invade. So um, with the exception of maybe aphids and Japanese beetles and a few others that like just about anything. Um, but generally, um, insects kind of favor a certain plant or plant family. So if you know what the plant is, you're more likely to find the insect. So does anybody have any questions that I can answer? There are a few questions in the question and answer section, and I'll, I'll read off the first one. Are there things that you can treat your soil with in the fall or the next spring that can help with these diseases? Not really. Um, the key to it is good cleanup in the fall and you know keeping on top of the diseases during the growing season. So if your plant is starting to show diseases and it dies or it's got leaves that are falling off and stuff. Clean those up as you go along. That's probably the best thing you can do. And then rotate, if you can, if you have the space to do it, rotate so you don't plant tomatoes in the same space every year. All right, the second question we had in there are, are there companion plants that can help tomatoes? Um, not really. Um, the only one that I know of that's kind of a general one for gardens is marigolds that often repels different kinds of insects and stuff because basically of the scent, I think. Um, 
But no, uh, there's really not anything that's, for example, is going to keep off the diseases that are on here. Um, not really, no. All right, and the last one that's on there is because I do canning, I know because of the UW extension that a lot of new tomatoes have a lot lower acidity. Does this have anything to do with diseases and issues? It seems to have become more of an issue. Um, I, that's a good question. Um, I really don't know. That would be one to ask uh, probably an extension horticulturalist. I've never been asked that question before. Um, I know that they have low acidity and hmm, I don't know. It could also be true too though that um, in the past, you know, when people save their own seeds, if a plant didn't do well, they probably didn't save the seeds from that plant. And so you were always saving seeds from plants that were probably more resistant to diseases. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So it's like, um, if, the disease, if the plant survived the disease, you save the seeds from it because it stayed healthy all year. So you're kind of selecting for resistant plants in that way. Um, and now we have like a lot of the hybrids, a lot of them are bred for flavor or size or earliness. Um, I don't know, that's a good question. And I think maybe because we're breeding for maybe sweeter tomatoes and that sort of thing, that may have something to do with it. Wait just a few more minutes for any questions that might be currently being typed in the Q and A. Um, so we'll wait a few more minutes. So thank you, Donna, so much for for doing this presentation tonight. It had I did not realize there are that many different diseases that look similar but are different and can be treated differently in tomatoes. Yeah, um, there's there's really quite a few. Um, and like I say, some of them look a lot the same. Um, so if you're questioning what you have, it's probably a good idea. It's a free diagnosis down in Madison to, to send them. Um, I think one of the handouts I had, or some of the things on the handout that I had that go with this are the addresses of the different places down in Madison. If you have questions about diseases, where to send samples, um, where to get um, information about growing tomatoes and that sort of thing. <laughs> Sorry, I shared in the chat link, um, just the uh, another time a link to the Google, um, Google Drive folder that we had with those resources that you listed in different websites in the slideshow presentation that Donna presented tonight. Um, otherwise, It'll be in the link on our YouTube channel and it was in the Zoom link, but yeah, it was, it's nice that there is help out there if you want yeah. some help for your garden. Um, if the people on here are local, um, sometimes I know we have people from all over the place, but um, I'm also looking for suggestions for future programs. So if you have any suggestions, you could put those in the, the chat or the Q and A, and um, let's see. I have, oh, I guess I do have access to the Q and A here. Um, yeah, so if anybody you know local here is wants to give me some suggestions for plant uh, programs, yeah. Pop. Um, before we go, I always like to share something about um, invasive species because they're really prevalent in many places in Wisconsin. Um, one that I see that is blooming right now in woodlands around here, um, I see it on trails and stuff. It's called creeping bellflower. 
And um, you can tell that this invasive one from other bellflower plants because the flowers are all on one side of the stem and the stem grows probably two to three feet tall. And um, it has heart shaped base leaves like these. These will be down on the ground, but at this time of the year, you will only see probably this flowering stem. Um, and it's um, got kind of long skinny leaves on the, on the flowering stem part. It likes moist soil, but can stand dry. Um, it has really deep storage um, roots down in the ground. So if you're gonna remove this plant, you have to really dig down deep or you need to spray it with like Roundup. Um, and it may reemerge from storage roots in future years. If you find it and you dig it, bag it and trash it or burn the plants. Um, the native harebell, which looks very, very similar, um, has a cluster of flowers on a drooping stem. And it would be shorter than this plant. And the lower leaves may not be present later in the season. So um, uh, like I say, I always like to kind of share one or two of these plants that are blooming around here at the time. So if people recognize them, they say, oh, that's an invasive that shouldn't be there. You know, and if you really want to be energetic and environmentally helpful, you can try and get rid of it. <laughs> How did you know, Donna, that that has been my bane of my existence in my flower garden at home? This I one? Oh my goodness. I have it so bad. And I, yeah. I rip it up and rip it all up all year, but you know, <laughs> It's that's horrible why. to get rid of. <laughs> that's why it has those storage roots. Yeah. yeah. And it, in fact, it can go dormant for a few years and then, you know, come back again because it's kind of just waiting there for a good opportunity to come out again. Yeah. <laughs> so I did have one comment in the chat that said determinate or indeterminate, which is best. Okay, it depends on how big you want the plants to get. Um, determinate plants probably get at the most about four feet tall and it's kind of more of a bush shape and the tomatoes tend to ripen in a shorter period of time. In fact, you may uh, you pick all the tomatoes off that plant before it freezes. Um, indeterminate, the vines just keep growing until the frost kills them and they can, I mean, I've got a, indeterminate um, cherry sized tomato that I've got two square uh, tomato cages stacked one on top of the other. And so sometimes I need a step ladder to pick the top fruits. So um, they just keep growing until the frost kills the plant. So it kind of depends, you know, if you want all your tomatoes to come ripe at one time because you want to do all your canning at once, then determinate um, is a good one. If you don't want to deal with tall cages, and all kinds of stuff. Um, determinate is a good one. Indeterminate, if you want them over a long period of time and you don't um, bother, do, you don't, it's not a bother to you to, you know, double cage them and, or, you know, stake them tall or whatever, you, know, you can do, you can use those too. Generally, the smaller tomatoes, like your patio type tomatoes, those are, would be determinate tomatoes. So that's the only difference between the two. Is there one that has more issues with different diseases and things, or are they about the same? They're about the same. If you're gonna grow one in a container, it's probably easier to grow a determinate tomato because it doesn't get so big. Sure. By the way, if you're gonna grow tomatoes in a container and it's not a, like a patio tomato, you're gonna need a container that's at minimum a five gallon pail and probably more like a half barrel kind of planter. Sure. We had another question. Can you prune indeterminate to make it smaller? You can um, indeterminate, they get what they are called suckers. Um, the, the plant stem grows up and then the first leaf first couple leaves come out and then between the leaf right in that crotch between the leaf and the stem there will grow another little leaf. 
And if you allow that to keep growing, that becomes another whole stem on an indeterminate tomato. Um, so some people pinch out those suckers, especially if you're going to stake them. That means tying them to a stake, you know, so you really only want one main stem that you're tying to the stake. Um, if you put them in cages, it's probably not so important to pinch out the suckers because you have the cage to contain them um, and you're not worried about tying them to a single post or stake. Um, too many suckers, you might end up um, keeping the airflow down, so you might encourage more diseases. Um, so it's kind of a matter of you know, how many of them are there growing <laughs> in there? And uh, how prone are your plants to disease every year? You might prune out some of those suckers if you, especially the ones on the lower end of the plant. So if you want that air to go through, but yeah, you can, you can prune them out so they're not so thick. You also lose some of the fruits too, but you'll probably have larger fruits overall, but less of them. Sure, that makes sense. Another question we had that they have heard, so it sounds like a, a little old wives tale here. <laughs> if you dig around the roots of a tomato, it will fruit if you do it later in season. Is that true? Um, if it hasn't gotten any fruit on it at all, it will probably force it to do that. Um, any plant that you plant, its whole purpose in being a plant is to reproduce itself. So if your tomato hasn't been fruiting and it's just all leaves and you're not getting any fruit and otherwise the conditions are not too cool, not too hot, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you dig around the roots, the plant is also all, all of a sudden saying, oh my gosh, I might die without making a fruit. I better start setting some fruits. So it may be as an old wife's tale, there's some truth to that because the, the plant is realizing that it has to reproduce itself. So it better get on with things. Um, if you already have a plant with a whole bunch of fruits on it, I wouldn't do that because that's destroy the plant's ability to take up water and nutrients and everything to ripen all those fruits. That makes sense? That answer your question? Yeah, they said, great, thanks. <laughs> so, so we'll make, wait another minute or two mm -hmm. here, but those are some great, great uh, questions to think about. Yeah. So just thank you so much, Donna, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. It's always, I, I always learn something, if not a whole bunch of things <laughs> when I oh. listen to them. I want to say thank you to the people who tuned in here, and um, I'm glad I could be of help to answer some questions, especially your bellflower question there. <laughs> oh, okay. So there is another another comment that says herb garden show question mark. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Because Donna, what are we going to be talking about next month? Next month, I'm going to be talking about um, getting your garden ready for, for frost, what to do before frost, what you can do to, to um, help your plants in the fall so that they'll remain their healthiest over the winter. So we're going to talk about that. Um, it seems kind of early to do that in August, but if I wait till the end of September, it might have frozen by then. So. Um, it's probably uh, a little bit early in that fact, but um, I think the September program would probably be a little bit late. Yeah, yeah, the weather changes fast if it wants to. <laughs> yeah, and like we talked about here with tomatoes, you know, if you want to um, hurry them up and, and get them to uh, ripen faster, you know, some of the things you can do. Yeah. Another comment we had was, can you... Um, add putting the garden to bed. And I think that was part of what you were gonna talk about too, yes. if I remember, yeah. That's basically, yep, getting your garden ready for winter, you know, ending the growing season and getting it ready for winter. Perfect. 
Oh, and we got, thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's it for tonight. Thank you guys so much for coming out and thank you. Thank you, Donna, for for doing this for us again and i guess that's all we'll say goodbye and we'll hope to see you again soon okay. thanks yep bye bye